And one of those things that we want to do before we even take one more step is to welcome every person that is watching us online right now. So from the Gold Coast, we say a big hello to everyone. So glad to have you here with us. Wherever you're watching from around the world, I pray that this, uh, this message encourages you and you can apply it to your local context of wherever, whatever country. If we can ever help connect you with a local church, that, or places where we're not, we'd love to make uh, anything we can do. Just email us and we'll do what we can. But it's an important week. Do you want to know why it's an important week here? It's because it is the launch of Connect Groups for 2023. And the reason that people are excited is because they know the difference of being in a Connect Group and not being in a Connect Group. Taking their faith in a sense and putting the rubber where the, meat, where the road meets to make sure that their faith is not just a Sunday experience. And so today's message is entitled, if you're ready to write this down, you are more than just an event. Yeah. Write that down. You are more than an event. You are more than it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are more than an event. And turn to your second choice and say, you are more than an event. I apologize that you're my second choice. You are more than just an event. This week, across the life of Globe Church, in every location that we're in, including online, we have hundreds of connect groups getting ready to meet in homes, to meet in cafes, to meet in boardrooms, sporting fields, even beaches, for those of us that live in the coastal towns. Sorry, Melbourne. But they get to go to the MCG. They get to go there for a connect group if they wanted to. Whether it's online or whether you're here on the Gold Coast and you live in northern New South Wales, right up to Brisbane, even into Ipswich, Logan, Pimpama, and all the way through the central parts of the Gold Coast, there are people that are getting ready to spend time in taking their faith from just an event on a Sunday and a time that we come together and make sure that their faith is actually outworked in community during the week. My prayer for you is that this year, if you've never joined a connect group before, that you would also see the reality of what can happen in your life when you do life with people. You were made to do life together. You were designed not to be alone. You know, Maslow's psychology law actually tells us that beyond the most basic things like every person needs a bed to sleep in, food to eat, water to drink, the most important part of every human's life is that they would have two things, that they are known and that they are needed. Someone knows my name. Someone knows my story. Someone actually needs me, that I matter, that I'm not just here filling up a seat. I'm not just here filling up air in the world I live in. Like someone needs me, that I make, can make a difference in somebody else's life. That is a desire of our hearts. When we're speaking about connect groups here at the church, connect groups aren't just a program that we run. They're not just an idea. Connect Groups is who we are. Connect Groups is our heartbeat as a church. It's a place where people feel connected. It's a place where people are discipled. It's a place where marriages are even formed. It's a place where people meet one another. It's a place where people are pastored when they're going through good things and bad things. It's a place where people can do life together and take the mask off from trying to pretend that they've got everything together and say, I need help. Connect Groups is what makes a large church feel small and that someone knows your name, someone cares about you. I want you to turn to your neighbor this morning, just ask a simple question, are you in a connect group? That is, could be a confronting question this morning. And if you're wondering what constitutes a connect group, let me clarify it. Two people is a date and three or more people is a connect group. Two people is a date, they're online. Two people is a date, but three is a connect group. So you don't want to get awkward, you don't want to go somewhere, it's just you and some woman hanging out, playing chess or something, that gets a bit weird. That is the definition of a connect group here at Glow. Where three or more people are gathered, it doesn't get awkward. <laughs> Many years ago, I went to university at a place called Sydney University. Uh, it's a leading university in Australia, just you know, in terms of ratings in Australia, but anyway, this is a side note. <laughs> For those in Sydney, respect to you. And when I started university, I was like, how can I work the system? Like, how can I get the most efficient use of my time in this five-year course that I'm about to go through? I've got a confession to make. I hope no one from the Sydney University lecture, lecturing staff or the faculty are watching online or go to our church. But in five years of university, I went to all of two lectures in total. In five years, two lectures in total. 
the first two lectures of the year in year one, and I realized, why am I coming to a lecture when they give me all the notes of exactly what they just said ahead of me, and I have to buy the textbook, and they're just going to read it word for word. Now, things might have changed this day, so I'm not recommending that those of you at university do what I'm doing. If you're a doctor, you need to save people's lives. I, I, I can't... I was doing an edu education economics degree, right? So I wasn't trying to save the economy. I was just like doing what I was needed to do. But I discovered that I could go into a room of 700 people. No one marked the role. No one knew I was even there. No one cared that I was there or didn't care. And I could literally watch it online. This is back in the early days. I could listen to the, the podcast. But I learned if I just get the reader, word for word, that person's going to tell me what was going on. I also discovered that there was another thing that I had to go to called tutorials. And it went from being like there is no accountability to extreme levels of accountability. I discovered that in order to pass my course or to excel with a credit or distinction or other things, I don't even know what they're called because I never got there. <laughs> I worked it out. Except the final year, I did quite well because I knew that was the last thing the employees look at. Anyway, I worked the whole system out. Let's just put it that way. But tutorials, I knew I had to in person attend 80% of the time because they would mark my name off and that they would require me to do group assignments and that the people in that tutorial would know me, they would know my name and they would know if I was there or not. Yeah. Talk about two extremes in one course. Yeah. University lecture, come in, no one cares. Tutorials, they hyper -cared. And so you'd work out how to get to 80% of tutorials maybe even 81%, just to ensure there was no one trying to like look over your shoulder. And I can tell you five years later, I graduated with only going to two lectures. Some would say, I don't know if I like this pastor anymore. <laughs> I'll just be honest. And others of you would be like, this guy's very clever, very efficient with his time. I worked a job, I got married, I was being a leader in a church. I mean, I was doing everything and I still managed to get two degrees. Now, I'm not recommending them to do that. I'm just saying, that's a lot like what this is like. This is a lot like a university lecture. You could come in here this morning and no one would know your name. You could be online right now and no one knows that you're watching alone. No, no one actually, that you're sitting next to you, maybe knows the details of your life. No one's here marking a role saying, you didn't come last week. Uh, no one's here saying that, you know, you have to come to church. And, but you're, you know, if you're here, it's a great starting point. But when I went to the tutorials, I felt like there was this responsibility that I knew the people's names. I had to look at the eyeballs of them and, and we had to do work together. And we were going to get assessed together. That's a lot like going to a connect group where someone does know your name. Someone takes a large environment like this and says, we care about you. We want to care for you, your needs you're going through. We want to celebrate with you on those good moments because the world you live in probably doesn't want to celebrate with you. They're probably jealous. And there's others of us that when we're going through a tough time, I want to know that somebody would actually come to the hospital and say, are you okay? I want to know that if I lost a loved one, that someone would be willing to stand next to me at a funeral. I want to know that in the space of all these people that are coming, that someone would say, hey, you're needed. Like you matter. And that is why connect groups matter. But can I give you an even more important reason why connect groups are important in the life of our church, in the life of you as a believer? It's because it wasn't just a good idea. It was God's idea. God had a plan for your life. And if all you've ever done is come to a Sunday service, can I just say to you, you are more than an event. Let me say it again. You are more than an event. You have been made for purpose to do life together. You have been made with purpose to make sure that you are in somebody else's life and that they are in your life. Exodus chapter 18 in the Old Testament, we see the beginning pattern of God when it comes to God's desire for people to be in small groups of people. We see a story of Moses. We've heard about Moses this morning from Naomi when we had worship, and we talked about him a few weeks ago with the burning bush. But when I read this story, we see wisdom come into his life from his father-in-law called Jethro, who also happened to be a priest. In Exodus 18, I read to you this morning from verse 14. Have you got your physical Bible this morning? I know last week, Pastor Josh spoke about bringing a Bible. Wave your Bible in the air. If you, this is a lot more impressive than the first service. Full marks. There's at least 10 of you here and only four in the first one. So we will build on that this year. This is my Bible. It is who I says. I, anyway, let's move on. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit as a judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me. And I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. 
You, are, you and all these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work that they have is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Master, uh, Moses, had not let you, Moses had not yet learned that he could not pastor millions of people. It was tiring him out, making all these big decisions. I don't know how he had a marriage and kids. But along comes Jethro, who is the father of his wife, and says, I think there's a better way of doing this. I've seen it because I've also lived this kind of life as a priest. He speaks to me and says, I think what we, you need to be doing, and God bless Moses for having a teachable heart with his father-in-law, but he says, there's a better way we can do this. Let's get some leaders. Let's section things off into different areas, decision makers and, and people. But then let's also form small groups of people so that people in Israel, that as we're moving through the promise, towards the promised land, they have accountability. That they know their name. If something was to happen to them, someone's going to care about them. And so Jethro brings this life to Moses. He brings this wisdom to Moses. And then it says later in this particular book of the Bible, it says that Moses actually had joy in his life and the people of Israel were happy. Moses was trying to be that one man hero. I think a lot of people still see church like, oh, well, Pastor Joel's here, he's going to pastor everyone. It's impossible. Maybe 10 or 12 people I could do well to disciple. Maybe the staff of the church, 50 people in the Gold Coast, maybe I could maybe know their names of their kids, their family. But it gets to a point where it's like, it's limiting. But the great news is in the New Testament, we see this whole other model that's got the principle from Jethro, but also says, we're all ministers. We are all called to care for the body. We are all cared to look out for others. It's not about one person being the hero. It's not about just one person doing things that everyone is going to be amazed by. It's about all of us playing the part in the body of Christ. When I was growing up, I loved playing sport. I still love playing sport. I'm just a little bit slower and more injured or injury prone these days. But I love playing sport. I don't think I've ever mentioned that at church before, but I do, I do love sport. I really love sport. And so I remember in under 12, it was a very significant year of my life because I, was, uh, I won three premierships in three different sports. The first one was tennis. I was a good tennis player. And I remember going through all the different, uh, you know, 10, 12 weeks leading up to the final, went to the semi-final, and eventually in the under 12s tournament in the area I lived in, Western Sydney, I won the championship. But it was quite a, thank you, it was quite a hollow feeling. <laughs> walking up to the net and shaking hands with the person as they looked upset, and I won, and I went to high, no, there's no one there. Oh, oh, okay, there you go. And I just took my prize, and went, I've got a bone to pick with Ellen this morning. Why is it? I think I'm going to start a connect group for these this people in the room. A few years ago, I realized every trophy I ever won, every medal I ever collected, it just disappeared. <laughs> is there every, any other male in the room that your wife has removed every trophy? Come, hands up, please. Let's start a connect group this week, was where's my, where's my trophy? That's a great name for a connect group, where's my trophy? Why has my wife thought her four-year-old scrapbook was important and my trophies were not important? I had many men in the first service come and talk to me and say they are still carrying and harboring guilt and a shame about what their wife did to their trophies. So I won the tennis tournament, but it was a hollow feeling. No one was there to celebrate with me. And then in that same season, our rugby league team won the under-12 championship and so did the cricket team. Even during the season, even though I didn't, it wasn't even maybe a game that was for the championship, taking a wicket and your whole team comes around and everyone's high-fiving and you score some runs or you score a try in rugby league and everyone's diving on you. Just in a mo minor moment of the season was more exciting than me winning the championship in the tennis and shaking a hand with an upset opponent. There was a difference between winning alone and winning as a team. There was a difference between like having those moments of the season where we won together and that hollow feeling of like, oh, I just took a trophy home and my wife binned it anyway. <laughs> it didn't really count for much. And that's what connect groups are like. We can just do life alone. We can come on a Sunday. Yeah. Or we can listen to what God has to say and then say, I'd rather win together. I'd rather celebrate together when things go. I'd rather have someone to cry with when things don't go well because they're like, I've been there before. Or maybe your marriage is in trouble and say, hey, to have somebody else in your life saying, I've been there before, but the good news is that God restored our marriage. God set us up and here's what we did. Can I pray with you? Hey, you know that addiction you're going through? Can I tell you, I've been through that as well and here's what God did in my life. When you're around people, I tell you what happens, you win together. You go through life winning. There's moments where you're gonna need someone to care for you and love you. That is what a connect group does. Not because it's just a good idea, because it's God's idea. Let's keep going. In the New Testament church, when we go to the book of Matthew, that's where the New Testament begins, we see the OG plan for the original church in the book of Acts. Jesus, 
It's developing his leaders. By the way, Jesus' answer to changing the world was to start a connect group. Get 12 young guys. That was his answer. He didn't do it by himself. He said, let's do it together. The OG church, the blueprint, starts with 120 people in the upper room. I think today it'd be good for us to always remember that we need to come back to the OG. Come back to the blueprint of what God's heart was for his church. Not what maybe we think it should be, but what does God say it should be? And do whatever we can to keep lining up with that. Did you know in 25 years, that church that started with 120 people, by the end of the book of Acts, which is 25 years, was between 100 to 120,000 people in one church. One location in Jerusalem. That's a pretty significant amount of growth that was taking place. So there's some different stages to this church where we went from 120 people at the, the first service, the Holy Spirit comes, that was a private gathering, and then it became a public gathering where Peter gets up and he preaches. The Bible says 3,000 people got saved that day. And then there was women and children. So let's say maybe 10,000 people on day one. Oh, pastor, the church should be small. Really? The original church was 10,000 on day one. But it started with 120 people. And it started with a connect group with 12 people. There's a reason as a church, every city we go and plant churches in, it starts with connect groups. Before you ever get to anything like this, it's always about people in homes with each other, praying with each other, meeting people, because that is the heartbeat of God for people. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, we see it goes from the additional, because we know in Acts chapter 2, we heard a bit from Pastor Josh last week, they talked about every day there was people being added. But in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, it speaks about now multiplications that are happening. It was more than just addition, it was now multiplication of disciples. In Acts 21, verse 10, it says in the Greek, there was tens of tens of thousands, which actually gives us, the, 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 the name is Myriadi, which means that there was 10 times 10, 1,000, 100,000. And scholars believe somewhere between 100 to 120,000 people after 25 years. Here's the amazing thing. At the time that that would have happened 25 years after Jesus ascending back to heaven, the population of Jerusalem was 250,000. In other words, one in two people had come to encounter Jesus. Do you know what's crazy about that is? Many of them, for their own eyes, would have seen Jesus do miracles and they doubted Him. Many of them would have seen the miracle of the 5,000 loaves and fishes and escaped and run away and had nothing to do with the faith. But yet after Jesus had ascended to heaven, there was such an attractional pull towards people that were of the faith or of the way that the Bible talks about, that something took place that one in two people said, I want what you've got. The way you treat each other, it leads me to go towards Jesus. The way you speak about each other leads me towards Jesus. The way that you are generous towards each other, I want that. And in homes, they gather around Jerusalem. We know that the Bible talks in even Acts 5 verse 42, which gives us this blueprint. It says, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. How do you take 120,000 people and take some sort of responsibility of discipleship caring, loving, they started connect groups. They started connect groups because they understood the temple courts and they understood the place of the house. It actually became the thing that saved the Christian faith. If you get a chance to come to Israel this year or in years to come, you'll see that when you go to where Solomon's temple was, the courts, which are the outside areas, not the temple, the outside areas, One of those is the Wailing Wall. Could easily, easily fit 50,000 people in one go. Talk about massive areas where people would come to worship and the temple would be there, but they would would go after the presence of God in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, that they would come and worship together in the outside courts. It's about large groups of people worshiping God. And then they would go into homes all throughout Jerusalem, little areas where they could be with each other and pray for each other and encourage one another. That was the blueprint of the church. It wasn't one or the other. It wasn't, I only believe in small groups in a home. It wasn't, I refuse to go to a big environment and be part of a church. No, they understood that the church had worship together and it had faith environments together. But then there were some things that could only happen in small groups of people when people knew each other's names and they were praying for each other and encouraging each other. It was the only way that discipleship could truly be outworked and accountability be put in place. And I've heard so many debates over the years. Oh, this with the big churches or everyone should be in a house church or the mega church model or all those different models. And for me, I'm like, I don't want to have an opinion other than what was the original. 
Look, I'm not going to try and get into the debate of how you feel. I want to go back to what does God say about the church that He wanted? He modeled it to us. They took a whole book of the Bible to describe it to us. Surely that's something we should all aim for. And if I am part of the church, because remember, this is not a church. This is a building. This is, this is not the church. You are the church. Jesus lives in you. We come together. The church happens. That's when things come alive. Now, here's the crazy thing, right? We know that in the first 300 years of the Christian faith was the time in history most documented with the most amount of growth of the Christian faith. At the same time, it was the largest amount of time in history where there was persecution. The Romans were feeding Christians to the lions for fun in the Colosseum. They were putting them on poles and lighting them ablaze so that they could have parties in the gardens. And yet there was this rapid growth to the point where one in two people in Jerusalem were of the faith. And in 300, we see the salvation of Caesar himself. And at which point he changes the law. And in that 300 year period, this is going to shock you, there was no such thing as a church building. Because they couldn't have church buildings because they would be burnt down and they'd be killed. It was the very thing that for the first 25 years as they were working this whole thing out, they were able to sustain the, the foundations of the Christian faith was we know that we can worship together. Now we've lost that, but we can still reach people in homes. Right now in the world we're living in, it's exactly the same in many parts of the world. We don't, they don't have the privilege in China right now of these environments. But I tell you what, on a graph, the Christians are going through the roof in China because of the underground church network that's happening with small groups in houses. In the Middle East right now, the same thing is taking place in extreme persecution. The church is going like this. Is it possible that comfort is the most dangerous thing of Christians? Is it possible that persecution is the best thing for Christians? That's a dangerous thought. I don't want to park there too long. But is it possible that we can get too comfortable? Because the reality is that joining a connect group, it's going to cost you something. Some time, some inconvenience. To lead a group means that I might have to actually do something for someone else. I might have to go and visit someone in a hospital. I might have to turn up to their baby's bar mitzvah. Whatever else is going on in their life. There's all these things going on in my life and I need to do something about my faith because guess what? You are more than just an event. Let me say again. You are more than just an event. God has got more for you. God has got amazing connections waiting for you. People want to know you. People want to know that there's a place for you. And it goes beyond just a Sunday event. We're living in a world right now, church, that is pulling us towards instant results. We're being measured by the most amazing amount of followers on, on social media platforms. We want to microwave instant faith. I've had a diagnosis. God didn't heal me within 10 minutes. That's it. I don't believe it anymore. Patience has gone out the window. And so connect groups require something of you. It's not as simple as it's going to happen like that. Relationships takes time. Building history within relationships takes even longer. Taking time to get a bit more vulnerable of where you're really at, that can take longer. It's not going to be a quick fix. But I want to encourage you, today is potentially a starting point for you to go, if this is the best life that God has for me, to be in community and to take the Sunday event and turn it into like actually who I am as a person and rub shoulders in spiritual community. It's worth considering what God has to say because maybe he knows best. If you are here this morning or you're watching online, if you just moved to one of our cities or you moved to the Gold Coast, you want to make new friends, the best thing you can do, join a connect group. If you're here this morning and maybe you've moved from another church and you're looking for, you know, just you know, kind of like, like, oh, I had all this history in the other church. I, was, I had friends in the other church or whatever it might look like and I hope they're still your friends. But you're here today going, I don't know as many people. The answer for you today, join a connect group because there's people waiting to meet you and build some new history and build some new friends and, and disciple and, and pray for one another. If you're here today and you've been coming to this church for a few years, Maybe you've been coming since we first started. And you've got familiar with God's plan for connect groups because maybe COVID happened. Maybe, maybe things have happened in your life. Maybe there's a connect group that offended you at some point. I'm sorry about that. Because the reality is that no one's perfect. This church isn't perfect, but I know that we'll keep on doing everything we can to make things right. Yeah. Wherever you've got people, you've got answers. Wherever you've got people, you've got problems. 
if there's a connect group you tried and it didn't work out for you, try another one. No one's precious about it. You might be like, in the season of life has changed and I'm not a young adult anymore, but I haven't found a great group for my, my family because they're little. Can I encourage and challenge you? Get back into a connect group. Maybe your habits have come you know, way off kilter from COVID. Well, get back on kilter. Maybe you stopped leading a group because you had so much pressure in your business at the time. Well, can I encourage you? We have a lot of people looking for a connect group. Get back into it. Like, I want to challenge you that all Christians, everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus, I believe there is a biblical framework to say that not only should I be coming to church, but I also should be in Christian community during the week, not just an event. If the worship team wants to come and join me this morning, the reason I say that is for the time I've been a young boy, I've had the privilege of always being in a connect group, leading a connect group. Really, I felt the only reason that I'm leading this church is because I was always faithful with connect groups. I've always had more connect groups because I was excited to disciple people, to lead people, to love people. They would multiply. Then, okay, now I'm going to lead more people. I never had a plan to do this. I wouldn't have sat through those university lecturers, I promise you. Those two would have too much. But God's always got a plan. God always knows. In order for God to do the fullness of what He can do in my life, go small. Love the individual. Love the people that are around you. Love your neighbor. Jesus made it so simple. Love God and love people. But if you're not around people, how do you love people? Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says this. Share each other's burdens. And in the same way, obey, sorry, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. You are doing what God has asked us to do when you share with each other. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. And I know so many people in this room, you are doing this. It's a reinforcement of who you are and who we are. But can I encourage you? How do you encourage somebody else if you're not with other people? How does somebody else encourage you if you don't know people? And this morning, I put this challenge out to every person in this room to say, hey, this is an opportunity for us all to do what the Bible speaks of, which is to love one another, to care for each other, to be concerned for one another, to encourage each other. And if you were this morning, would you just stand to your feet right through this room? Or right through them, front to back, left to right, would you just stand right through this place? In a moment today, I'm gonna to pray for all the Connect Group leaders in this service as we start our year. When you leave here today, there's a massive connect group. It's not massive, that's probably over. It's a big one out there, there's big signs, there's a stand, there's an expo out there with lots of connect group leaders who'd love to meet you and let you know about all the different options that are available to you. But there are people in this room that week in, week out, across a year, have taken up that challenge to love other people. They've taken up that challenge to, to give of themselves. They might've had to have opened their home and buy a packet of mint slices so that you'd be happy. I've always lived by the principle, if I go to a connect group, I always never turn up empty handed, never. I always have, I was like, okay, bring Tim Tams, bring the leftover Slarky, it's a Slarky I had from last night, whatever, just bring it. Be generous, be, that's us as a church, just be hospitable. But there are people in here, I, I wasn't able to go to a funeral that somebody else was able to stand next to someone. There were times that someone had a baby, I wasn't able to get there, I wanted to, but I couldn't, but somebody else in their connect group was able to get there. There's been times I wanted to make a meal, but you didn't want me to make a meal, I promise you. But somebody else was able to step up and make that meal. There's times where somebody in our church, because of the success in their business, was able to be generous to a family and go, we want to take care of you because I can see that right now there's a need that I can meet. There are people in this room all over the place that have prayed with people, cried with people, discipled people, loved people, hugged people. And that's called the church being the church. That's called Christians being Christians. That's called believers playing their part. And I'm so thankful 